Thank you very much, Kyle. And uh, thank you to all of you. I've had an incredible time visiting your campus. I found your generosity and your community amazing. It's refreshing. It feels actually like home to me. It feels like uh, family here. And I would love to come back anytime just to visit you and uh, be with you. So it's been a real honor for me. I've been greatly impacted by the other speakers. It's been amazing. Oscar is like a lion. <laughs> I feel the fear of God <laughs> when he preaches. He carries such an authority. It's powerful. And uh, David's message uh, was amazing today, both of them. Just such sharp, incredible teaching. Thank you to the worship uh, band United. And the other band who actually played today was just beautiful. Uh, worship, and love to be in that place of worship. I actually believe this statement that I'm about to say, evangelism, our missions, exist because worship doesn't. The Father seeks worshipers. In other words, he wants all tongues, tribes, and nations to worship him. And so that's our great goal. There'll be no more preaching in heaven, I'll be out of a job. <laughs> but there will be worship. Oh, there will be worship. So uh, thank you to the worship uh, team, community, for leading us. And thank all of you for you actually create the atmosphere of worship. We are a community gathering together here, a large community. But we're brothers and we're sisters and we're gathered in his name, that his kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. We have different backgrounds, different traditions, different testimonies, different stories, different struggles, different gifts, different graces. But we have one Father, one Lord, one faith, and we're one family. And so it's incredible to be here with you. And I'm honored to share uh, tonight. This is my last message while I'm with you. And I'm not saying this so you can buy me gifts, but if you do, um, I'm about a size 32 and a large. But it's my birthday, actually, tonight. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. I don't actually, I don't normally dress up. So but I'm a little dressed up. I'm just celebrating for, for me. But this is, about, <laughs> this is about as good as it gets. I'll get a little bit dressy. I don't very often wear a tie. So I'll get a little traditional, but I still need to have a little bit of rock and roll in it for me. So I just have to be authentic. Anyway, why don't you turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew in the 28th chapter. And as you're turning there, I'm going to pray with you again, and we're going to read from verse 16 and following, and tonight I want to speak to you about all for all. Tonight I want to challenge you to embrace all for all, but I want you to see the great privilege it is to embrace all for all. There's nothing else I would rather do. There's nowhere else I'd rather be. There's no greater treasure than the kingdom. No greater pleasure than the kingdom. And we have an incredible invitation to give all for all. And so I want to pray that each and every one of you will hear clearly from heaven and each and every one of you will play your part. And it might be very different from my part. It probably will be. And I don't want any of you to walk out of here tonight and to feel like you need to be like me at all. I want you to go out and to be authentically who Christ has called you to be and live your authentic mission for his kingdom out in the world where he's placed you. And you might give your best, whether that's the widow's two mites or it's two million. Whether you reach a million or you reach one, 
that you play your part, which he has orchestrated and planned good works that you would walk in. So I want to pray, and I pray that God, in whatever way, would use this small little offering that I have to uh, inspire you and ignite you perhaps even more. So let's pray, and we'll open up the word. Heavenly Father, I just am thankful to be here tonight in this place, in Biola, on this night, with these ones, my brothers and sisters, and I don't mean that in a cliche, religious term, but God, we are family, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be your name tonight. Your kingdom come and your will be done tonight in this place. And God, would you capture us tonight? Each and every one, would they be drawn by the beauty of the kingdom? When you called men and women, you said, if anyone wants to be my disciple. You never drove unwilling disciples. You invited all. If any man want, if any one thirst, if any one hungers, God, I pray that you, by your grace, would give them a taste and it would awaken them tonight to hunger and thirst after heaven. And we might be changed by you and we might bring that change to those around us. So we give you this time. I pray that I would just be your son, your friend, and you would shine your light, your grace through me for your glory, for your glory, for your glory, Jesus, for your glory. In your name we pray it, amen. Matthew uh, 28, all for all, I'm very excited to speak this message because uh, for me, honestly, preaching is like worship. I am just exalting in God when I preach sometimes. I, I often tell people I want to be the first one at the altar call because I preach myself into conviction every time. <laughs> if I am preaching on forgiveness, I start seeing the faces of people I have not forgiven. <laughs> If I'm preaching on giving, I get captured by that call. And uh, so as I preach tonight on this call of all for all, I am preaching to me. I'm preaching as one who stands uh, beside you, not above you. I don't think I'm even ahead of you. I think I'm walking beside you in this great adventure to follow him who calls us to give all for all. Matthew 28, verse 16 says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority, all, all authority, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Wow, what a text. Oh, I love this text. It begins with this incredible encounter with the risen Lord of the universe, with the resurrection of Christ, and they meet him on a mountain, on a mountain that they had been told to go to, and when they went to where he directed them, they saw him. I wanna to say to you 
that if you want to see the kingdom, if you want to see Jesus, if you want to see revival, you need to go where he directs you to go. Where he calls you is where he will meet you. He said earlier in this chapter, tell them to go to Galilee and there I will meet them. I want to meet him. I want to know where I'm going to meet him. And I'm on mission, not to go on mission for him. I'm on mission to be with him. Because I want to be with him. So tell me where you're going and I'm going to go with you. If you're going to a wedding to turn water to wine, I want to go to the wedding with you. If you're going to raise Lazarus from the dead, I want to go there and I want to see that with you. If you're going to feed the hungry, I want to go there and I want to feed the hungry with you. Sometimes religion can make you feel like you have to go for him. And yes, we do go for him. But we go with him. And our great motivation is to be with him. Where he is, that's where I want to be also. And so they went there and they saw him and they worshiped him, but some doubted. In this place, we worshiped him and some doubted. And not just in this place have we worshiped him and some doubted, in this place, right here, in me, I've worshiped him, but some doubts are in there too. I love the authenticity of the scripture. If I would encourage you to be something, I would encourage you to be real. I tell people I believe God will be most real in you when you are most real in him. God is a real, authentic God, and he is able to be himself, and he is able to reveal himself and show himself, and he wants to through me and through you, and we can be authentic, and I love that the scripture tells the story of the apostles. Do you know that these are the 12 best? The fate of Christendom rested in their hands. And boy, did they mess up. They barely understood the cross. Peter tried to rebuke Jesus to not go to the cross, for he thought he knew better. They doubted the resurrection, even though they'd been with him for three and a half years, and he told them often that he would be risen from the dead. Still, when he met them on the Emmaus Road in Luke 24, they doubted. Doubt is an insidious thing found in every human being, even after great encounters with God. It's part of our struggle. I'm not saying for you to make peace with it. I'm just saying don't condemn yourself if you too are made of the same flesh and blood, if you too are dust. For divinity wants to show itself in dust, and he puts his treasure in earthen vessels. And even the best, even the best, sometimes doubted. And God can wrestle with you and your doubts, and he will overcome them. And so come along. Come along for the ride. They followed him for three and a half years, discovering on the journey the truth of who he is. They worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus stood and came and said to them, now this is the most important thing. This is the most important thing of mission. And if you don't get this, you won't go. If you don't get this, the kind of dread you have of going will be the wrong kind of dread. It'll be a dread born of a fear that's born of unbelief because you don't get this or you don't believe this. But Jesus stood and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth, all of it is mine. All of it has been given to me. Then he said, go therefore into the earth. 
The go therefore comes out of the fact that you believe there is nowhere on planet earth that is not under his dominion. I believe he has all authority right here in Biola and everywhere that I go and everywhere that I walk and every place I set my feet, he has all authority there in heaven and on earth. In heaven, well, of course in heaven. The angels recognize him, but the Bible talks about a war also in heavenly places, that we have a fight against unseen powers and principality and the darkness that rules in this age. There is principalities and powers. There is dark forces that oppose the rule of the kingdom. And we become aware of that in the church and we have great teachings upon those realities and how we engage those realities in the spiritual warfare with prayer and worship and obedience. But sometimes even in our spiritual warfare, we act like we have to get the victory. And we forget that he's already gotten the victory. That on the cross, it says that Jesus Christ made a public spectacle of the principalities and the powers and the rulers of the darkness of this age, that he overcame them, that the serpent, his ancient foe, bruised his heel, but he crushed the serpent's head. Now I know they still have some authority, and there are authorities in heavenly places that we contend against, and we do stand against, and they are real, and they have some authority. But my friends, it's not a battle between two equal authorities. They may have some authority, but standing over them, sovereign over them, is one who has all authority. All authority. Over every name that could ever be named in this life or the life to come. So name your principality. Name your power. His name reigns and rules over all of them. And he casts out demons by the finger of God. It doesn't even take him flexing his arm because he is so much greater just with the finger of God. With the word, he can cast out a legion. So I want you to be aware, yes, it is a battle. Yes, it is warfare. Yes, you are called to fight the good fight. But I want you to know, you stand under the headship of the captain of the army of the Lord. And he has all authority tonight and to the end of the age over every power and every principality and every name that could ever be named. That's your sovereign. And so what a privilege to stand by him. And we are weak, but he is strong. So he has all authority tonight in heaven, and he has all authority on earth. Right now on earth, not he will one day have authority, not we work and hope that he will one day have authority, Not at the end of the age will he have authority. No, he said, I now have presently all authority on earth. He is sovereign over every single human being on earth. He has authority over all flesh, everyone. Even those who rebel against his authority rebel underneath his authority. They are still under it. They're still using the breath that he gives them to oppose him. They only exist by his sovereign will. They only breathe because he wills it. He has all authority on earth. And yes, they have some authority. And yes, humans have authority and our will matters. And we do not yet see all things subject to him, but all things are subject to him. 
He has all authority. And so when you see wicked rulers rise up and oppose him, and we must contend against them, and we must speak against them and pray against them, but know this, you have a sovereign, the same one who in the book of Daniel with a word can bring Nebuchadnezzar down because he has all authority even against kings who oppose him. The one who can break the back of Pharaoh and the rule of Egypt to liberate Israel, that same one still has authority on earth. And if you don't know that, how would you ever find the courage like Moses to go and speak to Pharaoh? How could I ever go and command him to let my people go? For he has authority. And he does have authority. Pharaoh had authority. But only some, and only because a greater authority willed it, allowed it for a moment, for a season. But know this, the mystery of sovereignty may be a mystery, but hang on to one thing for sure, that he is Lord. He is sovereign over every single nation. His kingdom rules over all. His sovereign kingdom rules over all. Not everyone is yet in his saving kingdom, but make no mistake, everyone is under his sovereign kingdom. And he's far above them all. He has all authority on earth. You must know that if you're to go into the earth. Because fear stops us. Fear paralyzes us. Because we feel we're going into the enemy's territory. We're going into the darkness. But when we believe this is my father's world, I'm at home in my father's house. And so we're at home because we believe in the church this is the Father's house. And we feel comfortable that he reigns here in the Father's house. But it's also your Father's world. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The Lord's strong and mighty in battle. And it's his world. And so you go not for him to do it for him, but you go with him and in and under his sovereign authority. All authority in heaven and earth. I can preach it, I can believe it, and I do, but I pray the Holy Spirit would make it real to you so that you would believe, that you would believe. I believe there's nowhere that I go that he does not rule and reign. And my confidence is in that and in him. But I believe if we are to see a great awakening, if we are to see a global mission, if we are to see a mission movement again, we have to stand on the same mountain that they stood on. And we have to hear Jesus ourselves say to us, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, go in my authority. Go in my authority. If we don't hear it, we will always fear it. We'll fear to go because we're not sure who has authority, who's in control. I believe one rules over all. He has all authority over all the earth and over all principalities and powers, and every ruler of the darkness of this age. So he said, go therefore in to all nations and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you to embrace the great adventure to influence nations. God wants us to influence nations. Now sometimes we get overwhelmed by the bigness of the need because we feel like it's up to us. But he said, no, my yoke is easy and my burden is light because it's actually up to me, he said. But I want you to come alongside with me, to be yoked with me, and to go into the nations with me, and to be a part of what I believe will be the last great awakening. 
I believe that scripture is true. The knowledge of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Yes, does not mean that every single person will be saved. Yes, there will be resistance, but there will be, I believe, a global revival before the return of the Lord. And I believe there's great scriptures to prove that if you study your history and the history of revivals, you'll find that men like Edwards and the reformers and the Puritans and a great history that went before us believed that, that the kingdom of God would truly go into all the earth because of Christ wants all nations to be truly discipled. And if he's truly sovereign, then I believe it shall be And we have the invitation to come alongside and to play our part. And it is an invitation. What greater thing could you do? What greater thing could you imagine? What greater dream could you dream? What greater glory could you touch than the glory of the kingdom? Than changing the world. And let me tell you, there's nothing else on planet Earth more valuable than people. And so to go after the great treasure of people for the great treasure of the kingdom, there is no greater thing. And I don't know what your part is to play. I don't know where he's going to send you and what he'll say to you, but I know he wants to use you. And he wants to use you to help heal this earth and to bring his kingdom into all nations, my nation, your nation, global transformation, all the earth. That's the vision of Jesus. If I was to say that, it would sound like some great conference hype, some great utopian dream. And it would be if I said it. For what authority do I have? to speak on Christendom. I didn't create it. But the king, Jesus, said this is my mission. And I believe he said it very confidently because he believes he has all authority. He's not worried out there going, I wish I had a bit more authority. (laughs) He knows he has all authority, but he has chosen to touch the earth through the earth. And he's chosen to reach people through people. And it is a great privilege that he calls you to go into all nations, every nation, every nationality, every culture. And I believe to go like he went, to enter into it. He came incarnationally and entered into this world. He engaged it. He lived among them. He dwelt among them and they beheld his glory. We have to change our idea of mission. When Jesus wanted to reach the earth, he didn't set up a pulpit from heaven and shout down. He came into the world. And when he came to the Jewish people, he came as a Jew. He entered into a culture. He entered into the world. He entered into people. If you want to reach people, enter into their world. If you want to reach a culture, enter into their culture. Take the kingdom with you. Let the kingdom govern you and rule you. Don't let go of Christ. Be set apart on the inside, but be deeply sent into that culture. And let Christ be your model missionary. And he loved and he healed and he was a friend of sinners. He was a friend. And he proclaimed, he preached and he taught and he brought community. Go as he went, be sent as he was sent. And so go into a culture, engage that culture, go into every sphere of life because I believe he wants all the earth and every sphere of the earth. I believe he wants government to be under his sovereignty. That does not mean under the church where the church rules over all. No, his throne rules over all. He rules over all. I believe he wants education to be to the glory of God, health to be to the glory of God, all things under him, not under us, under him. That's his vision. So whatever sphere of life you go into, take the kingdom, befriend those people, befriend them. 
Go in and be sincerely concerned for them and serve them and walk among them and live among them and dwell among them and show another way. Show a more excellent way. Show the way of love. Show the way of grace. Show the way of the kingdom. To every people, he said, not just people who look like me, not just people who think like me, for how are we any different than the world? I remember being in school and everyone needed to find their clique, where they fit. And the jocks hung out with the jocks. And the musicians and the artists hung out with the musicians. And the preps hung out with the preps and the bad boys hung out with the bad boys. And we had our little groups and we feel comfortable because I feel like you accept me if you're like me. And we do the same in church. We try and find people like us, but Jesus came for all people. And he was constantly breaking the barriers that people put up. He would come for the young and the old. And some people thought, no, it's not for the young. And they tried to stop the children. He said, no, for all people, all the earth, the young, let the children come. And he would come for men and women. And they thought, no, it's really this mission is for men, not the women. He said, no, for men and the women. I'll pour out my spirit on my men servants and on my maid servants. And he crossed racial lines. And they thought it's just for Israel. And he said, no, it's always been for all nations. And he treated them the same. And he loved them the same. And he loved the Samaritans who even the other apostles didn't want to go and see unless they brought fire down upon them. And we have people groups that we look down on. It's part of our sinful nature. We have people that we're not as comfortable with or that we judge. But Christ wants us to reach all people, poor and rich, young and old, all people for his glory, saints and sinners. Well, at least we can disqualify some people who are too bad. No, he said, I came for the sinners. And in fact, if you go read the gospel, you will find what got Jesus in the most trouble was the people that he hung out with. For they said, if he is truly the son of God, why is he a friend of so many sinners? He's a friend of drunkards and gluttons and harlots and tax collectors and thieves. He said, yes, I'm a friend of all who will receive me. They didn't understand it. They had people they disqualified. The woman at the well divorced five times, surely not her. Yes, grace for her. Grace for all the women caught in adultery, ready to be judged, and he defends her. and says grace for her, the gospel for her, forgiveness for her, go and sin no more, but know this, I stand by you and for you, and I'll give my life for you, all people. I remember preaching a series about evangelism and how Christ was a friend of sinners and was most often found among people outside of the walls of the church. I was never raised inside of the walls of the church. I've loved the church and served it for years, but I had been a chief of sinners, and that's all who my best friends had been, and Christ saved me, and I got so involved in ministry and church and pastoring. As I was preaching this, I was struck by the hypocrisy that I said, I hardly hang out with sinners, though of course we're all sinners. But truly, I I hardly hang out with anyone outside really for friendship. I'm always with just with church people. I was struck by it. I thought of how Jesus was accused by the, because of the people he hung out with. And I thought, when's the last time I've been accused as a minister because my friends are such a motley crew? And so I went back to some of my old passions of sport and competition and began to train and and befriend fighters. One, because I loved the passion. Two, I wanted to engage and enter into the world and their world. And some of my best friends now in my community, some of them are bouncers at bars. One of them was a bouncer for a long time at a strip club. And he's my friend. And through some of the toughest years Of my life, he stood beside me and I stand beside him and he knows what I am and he knows what I believe and I try and live it out authentically before him. When I struggle, I'm real with it. And 
I share Christ with him, but I try to share it with him as a brother and as a friend, not as one over him, not as one self-righteous. And I've seen so many of them be drawn to the reality of the friendship of Christ. We have to realize Christ wants to come into their world, and we have to enter into their world to be missional here in your communities, to see Christ come into the world and overseas in the nations, all peoples. And he says, do what? Disciple them, all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All of the Godhead. I said this is a message tonight of all for all, all authority in heaven and earth. All the nations, all cultures, all people groups, every tongue and tribe. Everyone, it goes, the gospel goes to all. Christ for all. And he said, baptize them, immerse them. And yes, it's water baptism, but bring them into the community of the Trinity. Christianity is a community. We're to model our community on the Trinity the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. A community of love. Baptize them, immerse them into the community of heaven on earth. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Would we embrace all of the Godhead and all of the community of heaven, the unity and the community? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Jesus said our community on earth should be a picture of that community in heaven. That we might be one as Jesus and the Father are one. That even marriage is supposed to be a picture of heaven. Community, community. And the world wants to see authentic community. Real people with real love and real struggle standing beside each other. Bring them into that community. We need to create those communities. See, churches become those kind of communities. Into the Father and the fullness of the Father. Into the Father's love and into the Father's leadership. Into his wisdom and into his affection. That they might know the Father. That we might know the Father. That you might know the one Jesus called Abba, our Daddy. Our Father who is in heaven. And that's a term of affection for it's a community, a family. And into Jesus, and not just the part of Jesus you like, but all of Jesus. Jesus the teacher, and Jesus the healer. Jesus who is a lamb, and Jesus who is a lion. Was there ever two more different creatures in nature than a lion and a lamb? And yet Jesus is both of those things. And we might show them both of those sides. I take my children to a wildlife park where we see animals, and there's lions, and there's bears, and there's wolves, and cougars, and all kinds of dangerous animals. And at the very end part of the wildlife park, there's a petting zoo for the kids. And in the petting zoo is bunnies, and lammies, and little sheepies. And the kids get to go in and they get to pet the lambs. And they brush the lambs because lambs are so safe. And we trust lambs. Because they're cute and cuddly. And they're meek and they're mild. And they're so gentle. And I never worry about my children petting lambs. But I've yet to be in a wildlife park where inside of them there's a lion in the petting zoo. We never let our children pet lions. Jesus is both meek and mild, dangerous and wild, fierce and fearless, but so safe, but so dangerous, but so safe, (laughs) but so dangerous. And I want all of him, I want to encourage you to embrace all for all. Don't just embrace a part of him. Embrace all of him, every side of him. Embrace all of the Spirit. Baptize him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Embrace every role of the Spirit, the Spirit as your teacher, the Spirit as your comforter. Let him comfort you, the Spirit as your convictor, that he convicts me because he loves me. Like a father, like a coach, he convicts me when I'm doing wrong. 
I've been coached and I've coached. And a coach, when he believes in someone, he corrects them because he believes in them. And he believes they have the ability to be better. Correction is never rejection. God says he corrects every child he loves. So I embrace the Spirit's correction. I, the only time I get worried is when I lose a sense of his correction. Because I know this side of heaven, I never reach perfection. And so I'm thankful it's in love. But embrace all those roles. Embrace the fruit of the Spirit. And I would encourage you to embrace the gifts of the Spirit. Embrace the Spirit coming like a gentle dove. And embrace the Spirit coming like a violent rushing wind. Embrace the oil of the Spirit that's nice and peaceful. And embrace the fire of the Spirit that burns and is fierce. Embrace every side of the Spirit. Don't take a part and a portion, but embrace all for all. All for all. All nations. All of the Godhead. All authority in heaven and earth. And make disciples of all people, teaching them to obey all. Make disciples of what? Of ourselves? No, make disciples of Jesus. Make disciples of the kingdom. Christ called people to follow me. The strongest leader on earth, under the, when Jesus was on earth, the next strongest leader to him was John the Baptist. What a strong voice. He was so strong as a leader that people actually thought he was the Christ. And he had to convince people he was not the Christ. He had to tell people, I am not the Christ, I'm just a voice. But I'm a voice of one waking a nation. And they felt the voice of one crying out. They thought, he must be the Christ. And he said, I'm just the one. And he said, here's my whole message. He's the lamb. There is Jesus. Follow him. And people left him to follow Jesus. And we call people to follow him. To follow Jesus. We point people away from ourselves because we are imperfect. We do our best and we give our best. But there's one we're called to make disciples of, to follow him, to follow the one perfect one and all of his kingdom and all of his power and all of his glory. And I would encourage you to embrace all of this kingdom because Jesus discipled people not just with words. He did teach them words, embrace all scripture. But he discipled people with his works, works of mercy, which is a part of the kingdom and touching the leper, and feeding the poor, and rescuing the broken. Works of power, because it's part of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is not just in word, but power. And the kingdom is powerful here on earth. Power over demons, as he delivered people. Power over sickness, as he healed people. And that does not mean that this side of heaven, every single person will be healed, for the kingdom is not yet here fully, though it is fully here. It's here, but it's increasing. It's now and it's yet to come. It's an ever increasing kingdom. But we are called to make disciples of the kingdom and of the king. May you embrace that, may you embrace all scripture. The song of songs that disciples you in love and romance and the sacredness of sexuality and passion. Yes, that book's in the Bible right in the middle. Song of songs. Well, some people I know, friends of mine who are unsaved, said they think God's against sexuality. I said, no, he's not. Eden means a place of delights, and God blessed the man and the woman to be together in the garden of pleasure. And he put rules there to protect it. And Song of Songs is a celebration of love and marriage and romance. But he wants it to be governed. It's not suppression of your sexuality. It's the sanctifying of your sexuality that scripture speaks to. And God has a higher way and a better way and a more excellent way, a way of love. And so embrace the scripture that speaks to everything. It doesn't just speak to life in the church. It speaks to life in the family. Teaches me to be a better father and a better man and a better husband and a better servant in my community. And so I would encourage you to embrace all scripture and make disciples in every area of life, because Christ has come for life. Christianity is a way of life. I'm gonna call my next church plant Revive, 
and because it's about life. Revive means to live. He came that we might have life, and he wants you to live and to be alive in his kingdom. And that every area might come under his kingdom and his lordship and his wisdom. And so embrace those things, all of the kingdom. For how long? For always. He said, always, for lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Everywhere you go, he'll be with you. On the mountaintop and in the valley when you walk through valleys, he'll be with you there, even when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Even there, he'll be with you. He'll be with you in the prison, Joseph would tell you, as well as in the palace. David will tell you he'll be with you in the cave of rejection and also in the castle of exaltation, everywhere at all times and every season even to the end of the age, even to the end of the age. He wasn't just with the early church for that first time, then he left us, and I'll see you at the end of the age. No, he said, I'll be with you to the end of the age. I'll be with you. I believe that he still wants to dwell in his church in the same kind of power as he once dwelt, even to the end of the age. I believe he saved the best wine for last. I don't believe he started a great fire just to let it die out at the end. I believe he wants us to go from glory to glory and strength to strength with ever increasing glory. And so embrace his presence even into the end of the age. And lastly, let me say this, and I know I've gone on, thank you. But he needs all of you. You, each and every one of you, individually you. Not a bunch of replicas of one another, but each individual, he called all the disciples, and they were all different, and you're all different, and be uniquely you. Be who you are. Be who you are. Peter was loud and brave and outgoing. John was the mystic lover who put his head on the heart of Jesus. Thomas was a bit of a skeptic and struggled in doubt. Matthew was a, ta a tax collector. Whoever you are, whatever your story is, be you. I have four beautiful children, two boys and two girls. I don't want any of them to think they have to be more like someone else. I don't want them to think I should have been more like Josiah. I don't want one of them to think Josiah is my oldest. Oh, dad loves Josiah more. If I was more like Josiah, I said, no, I love you all the same. And I love your uniqueness, and they're so unique. One's so strong, and some are so gentle. One's a gymnast. One wants to be a rock star and a fighter. <laughs> I said, be whatever you want to be for the glory of God. Whatever God's called you to be, I want to encourage you in it. But I want you to feel that you are who God made you to be. With your unique gifts and graces and passions, just follow Christ. And I pray that for each and every one of you, he will be most real in you when you are most real in him. He knows you, he formed you, he made you. He has a call for you. He's graced you, and he wants you to be free in him and to let him, as a lion, as a lamb, be free in you tonight. That you may go out everywhere you go, letting his kingdom and his light shine through you. Shine like the light of the world that you are. Let his light shine in you and through you. Why don't you stand up, and I'll pray with you. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.